Hey, sixth graders, thanks for joining me as we discuss James chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. Please make sure that you have read these verses before viewing this video. Also, please make sure to view this video in its entirety, I promise it won't be an eternity, before you go to complete your assignment, which is to create your own notes. So let's dive right on in. So our objectives for today are to be able to summarize James's warnings to the rich and to explain how we should live while we wait for the Lord's return. So the first topic that James addresses in verses 1 through 6 is a warning to the rich. Now, when you first read this, you may have thought something along the lines of, well, that's scary, but I'm not filthy rich nor am I oppressing anybody, so this has nothing to do with me. However, James gives a warning in these verses that not only applies to the rich, but to everyone. So how could you summarize the warning that he gives? Got any ideas? So his warning is to avoid oppressing those who have less than us and, and this is the big and that applies to everyone, that we don't primarily focus on storing up treasures here on earth, which will be our focus for right now. It is super tempting, especially with online shopping right now, to just buy, 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 right? Buy all the things. Americans on average, and this is a true statistic, Americans on average spend about $1,000 hundred dollars on non-essential items per month. Over one thousand dollars are spent per month on things that we don't need. We as a society, we love, and I mean love, to buy things, stuff, gadgets, and gizmos. In Bible times, this was also true. As humans, we tend to think that the more we have, the happier we will be. But James is contradicting this and saying, mm, that's not true. Money and things don't buy happiness. Oh, so, what are the dangers of being like the rich man described in these verses? Take a moment to pause this video and reread those verses to yourself. What are the dangers of being like the rich man described in these verses? So the dangers are not only are there things going to be rotted, eaten by moths, and corroded, but that they focus so much on things and stuff that their hearts are now fattened in a day of slaughter. That's actually the term that James uses. When they stand face to face with Jesus, Jesus will hold them accountable. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be in that situation. I want to be joyful and happy to be face to face with Jesus in his presence and not fearful because I know that I did wrong by only focusing on getting stuff here on earth. The Bible addresses this issue quite frequently because the Lord knows our hearts and knows we need reminding of this. So, can you find another verse in the Bible that warns against just storing up treasures here on earth? Feel free to use the concordance or anything you need to help you find some verses. So did you find at least one verse where it talks about treasures or storing things in heaven rather than stuff? Awesome! I'm going to share one that I found that the Lord really put on my heart. And it's Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I'm going to repeat that last part again. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus made it very clear that our focus should be on heaven and not on stuff. We should be growing closer to God, serving others out of love, and sharing Jesus' love with others so that they can come to the party that's waiting for us in heaven, rather than just focusing on gathering stuff. 
So now let's take a look at the sec second section. That was really hard to get out. Second section, second section, second section that we read today. So James 5, verses 7 through 12. The first thing that James reminds us of is that we need to be patient for the coming of the Lord, the second coming of the Lord. This is an awesome reminder. Not only did Jesus die and come back to life three days later, but he will return again. How easy is it to forget that truth and the busyness of things and the chaos that we're living in? It's so easy to forget that simple truth. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, it says, But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. So the second coming will happen, but no one knows when. Therefore, we must, be, we must patiently and expectantly wait. We don't know when Jesus will come, but we need to be ready and patient for him to come. In verse 11, James asks us not only to be patient, but to be steadfast as well. So what does it mean for someone to be steadfast? Try to tell me in your own words, what does it mean for someone to be steadfast? What does it look like? Any ideas? Perfect. So to be steadfast means, so this is the actual dictionary definition, is to be dutiful, dutifully firm and unwavering. This means that when the going gets tough, we as believers continue to cling to God and to press on. So James mentions Job as a steadfast character, but can you think of another biblical figure that we could describe as being steadfast? And then why? So go ahead, pause this video, do a Bible scavenger hunt, think about it. What other biblical figures could be labeled as being steadfast? Yeah, so we can list a few, right? So. The ones that come to my mind are Abraham, Jesus, Noah, Job is mentioned by James. I'm going to die. We're going to take a look at Noah's life. Isn't this a fantastic, interesting picture? So in my opinion, one of the best examples of steadfastness besides Job and of course Jesus is Noah. Those of you that were raised in the church, you know the story of Noah and Noah's Ark. But have you ever stopped to think about the story from Noah's perspective? So follow me on this journey here, as we kind of imagine. Here was Noah, living his life righteously for God. And then the Lord tells him to start building an ark. Out of nowhere, start telling him to build an ark. Noah most likely lived in an area that was dry and desolate, right? So kind of like the desert. Could you imagine having to construct an ark in that sort of environment? You have to gather all your resources, get everything together. Could you imagine trying to explain why you're building an ark to your family? No one has to go home and explain it to his wife, to his children. What about to his friends? Now imagine the mockery that Noah must have faced when others walked by his house and there's Noah building his ark in his front lawn. I'm sure they thought he was crazy. But did this stop Noah? Absolutely not. He continued to do what the Lord called him to do and didn't waver one bit. That, my friends, we can say he is steadfast. He did not waver. He was unwavering and he was dutifully firm. He knew the task that the Lord gave him. So, Take a moment and reread verses 7 through 12. What adjectives describe God in these verses? So pause this video. What adjectives describe God in these verses? What characteristics are shown of God? So what's the first adjective that you found? Yeah, that's right. He's patient. Verse 7 makes it clear that he's patient. 
What other adjectives? Yeah, we could say that he is the judge. Verse 9 actually calls him the judge. What else? Yeah, so verse 11, they give us two more adjectives. He's compassionate and merciful. And what about verse 12? He's faithful, right? So here are the adjectives that are described in these verses. He is the judge. He's patient, compassionate, merciful, and faithful. By the way, thank you for helping me find those adjectives. So looking at that list of adjectives, how does this impact your view of God right now? What characteristic of God did you need reminding of the most? So here we have our list of adjectives. Which one did you maybe know about, but you forgot? And it's just a reminder of the truth of who God is. Which one kind of hits home with you, just kind of sinks into your heart? And then, how does this impact your view of God right now? So once again, looking at that list of adjectives, how does this change your focus of whatever is going on in your life right now? I would love to hear your thoughts on these two questions. So if you would share that with me, I would love to hear just what the Lord is speaking to you through those that we have finished our lesson, I wanted to go through and show you how to fill out or create your own James notes. Remember, for chapter five, you're creating your own notes. So on Google Classroom, you'll see this document, um, and we are going to create a minimum. Now, you can and probably should go over 15 questions, minimum, and answers. So we're going to go over some examples right now of good questions to ask, and you will answer them. Um, remember to provide answers for each and every question that you write down. So we're going to go over two examples right now. So you're, please leave the, um, the directions up at the top, and you're just going to type right below. You can change the font. You can change the color whatever you want to make it creative and fancy, if you will. Okay, so we can use some of the questions that I did in the slideshow. Um, so during the lesson, we had a few questions. Now, you're more than welcome to use some of mine, but I want to make sure that some are your questions as well. So the first question that I had asked in the lesson is, what are the dangers of being like the rich man described in these verses. So I've labeled it with the question number, and then if you hit enter and backspace so you get rid of the two, you can go ahead and answer it. So you will write in the answer. Don't leave it like this. You will write in the answer. And then when you go to the next one, you can click two and it'll automatically indent. And let's take another question from the lesson. Um, ooh, here's a good one. James reminds us to be steadfast. I can't spell steadfast. What does it mean for someone to be steadfast? So keep in mind that you are, when you create your own questions, and don't forget the answer, sorry. You're going to write in the answer. Don't write what I just wrote. You write your answer. But don't forget that when you are thinking through these questions, not to do just literal, um, like what verses do we talk about today? But you want to think about some questions, create, develop some questions that take a moment and some deeper, higher level thinking. Those are the kinds of questions that we're looking for when we grade this. Okay, um, and then I put it up here, but just as a reminder, please avoid bullet points. So don't give me bullet points on what the chapter talked about. Um, and please don't do true or false questions. Okay, so open-ended questions that take a little bit higher level 
thinking. So use the previous notes for chapters one through four to guide you through this. You can use some of the questions in my slideshow um, through the lesson, but also make sure to create your own. Be creative. If you get stuck, pray about it, reread the passage, and I can't wait to see what you guys do. Remember, be creative with it too. Make it all pretty and awesome and fancy, whatever adjective you want to give to it. Make it your own. Okay. If you have any questions, let us know. Love you guys. Bye.